So welcome to the breakout. I'm sorry for the confusion in regards to the different spaces. We're glad you're here. Uh, Michelle Weaver and myself, Michelle LeBron Griffin, are consultants from the State Education Resource Center, and we will be guiding you through uh, the questions for the stakeholder input. So as you heard from um, the commissioner and Tanya from the State Department of Education, we're looking at the ARP or the American Rescue Plan for the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. You saw that the dollars um, have varied and we're certainly looking at a large amount. So we're seeking your input in the five areas, describing the current status and needs, safely reopening, maximizing state level funds for student support and supporting LEAs in meeting student needs and supporting the educator workforce. So Michelle, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to um, describe the first question. And I am going to do my very best folks to uh, record the summary or highlights of what is expressed, but also note that anything I don't capture will certainly be captured in the recording and transcript. If at any point um, you would like to correct what you see in the note taking, uh, you can certainly um, revise that obviously uh, as you are speaking with your open mic, or you could also post something into the chat and we will try to pick up that from when we save the recording as well. So go ahead, sure. Michelle. Sure, and just before um, I get started on that, just so in case you came in just a little bit later, we do have representatives from the State Department with us in the room as well. Um, and again, we want your feedback. This is um, a, our time for you to tell us what you think, as, as Tanya said in the other room. But there are people in the room who like, may, may jump in, um, so you'll know that they will identify themselves as such. So our first question, describing the state's current needs and status. Um, what's on the slide, as you can see, is what CSC has done in their approach so far. So pr prioritizing, providing support, guidance, and resources. And Tanya talked a lot about that in terms of what was done when we first all got sent home and had to do the, the, the work and the learning from, you know, from our, our homes uh, virtually. Addressing the digital divide was a huge, a huge lift that the State Department took on last year. And being committed to addressing the social and emotional needs of students and launching Accelerate CT Task Force. So the question that we wanna to pose to the room and get your feedback on, given the progress and promising practices coming from the CSDE in the last year, are there any other unidentified needs you would like to mention? In particular, what other needs should be accounted for when it comes to student populations most impacted by the pandemic? And this is really an open forum. So, um, if there are a lot of people who want to say things at one time, you can do the right, use the raise hand feature. You could find that under the reaction button in the Zoom. If not, just feel free to unmic and start talking. Hi, my name is Jamie Kaminsky. I, I couldn't find the raise your hand button, so sorry. That's fine. Hi, Jamie. So, hi. So um, I am a visual arts educator in West Hartford. I'm also a parent to two, one with profound special needs. Um, so one thing I would really like addressed is when we talk about the digital divide, there are a population of students that cannot access education digitally. So <clears throat> for my younger son, he had uh, me as his educator from March to September. So. I'd really like to hear about uh, enrichment opportunities that are targeting uh, students with severe special needs. By way of like, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it needs to be formally called uh, recovery or just, you know, just getting back into the swing of things has been really hard. My son, my younger son has autism. So that's what I'd like to hear about the digital divide. Um, there just are some that, that can't cannot access education that way. So thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Evening. This is Ann Smith. I am the executive director of AFCAMP Advocacy for Children. 
We are a community parent resource center funded by the U.S. Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs. So I do have a particular interest in how the state is responding to the needs of our students with disabilities and particularly our students with disabilities who are students of color and our students who are English language learners and others who are in those categories that we have seen experience the most severe impacts of COVID-19. And as we are looking at these areas, it would be important that we take into consideration that our students with disabilities have guarantees of a free appropriate public education um, that have not been in any way um, relaxed or diminished uh, by pandemic. And so to the extent that we are looking at how to address the needs of all students, it's important that we look at the needs of those students with disabilities who were not able to meet the objectives in their individualized education plans. And that as the department is providing guidance to LEAs, that it's really critical to keep in mind that where we are spending funds to advance the concept of recovery and enrichment, that does not replace the obligation to provide compensatory education services and support for our students with disabilities who uh, were not able to make adequate progress in their identified plan goals. And thank you for that. And again, as um, Michelle's capturing the notes, please feel free to let us know if, if something that's there is not exactly what you meant or if you if you want to clarify and also as you're giving us some um, your ideas and sharing with us um, also feel free to give us specific examples of what it would look like for the state department or for connecticut um, in terms of its education to to meet the needs of the students that that you're talking to us about because that will help us and the state department to think more about exactly what it is that we want to strive for um, with this funding that we have access to kate Hi, um, thank you so much for having this forum. Um, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure, thank you. I, I just, I'd like to echo some of the comments that have been previously made regarding subgroups of students, such as those with disabilities. Um, also another group is students for whom English is not their first language. Um, they're gonna face um, some unique challenges. Uh, but I also wanna speak to the very dire mental health crisis that is affecting our children at every grade level and in every zip code. Um, I'm concerned a little bit about some of the very small districts that are rural in Eastern Connecticut that aren't getting a lot of the funding, but uh, have are facing many kids who are homeless, who have dire mental health issues. Um, and, and so I am concerned about some of the areas of the state that may not be typically identified as having needs, but they may be disproportionately affected as well. Um, I also do think the levels of trauma, depression, um, anxiety in children is skyrocketing. It was before the pandemic and it's only gotten um, extraordinarily worse since then. How uh, did you ensure that some pool of money is available to districts who need to hire additional staff. Um, one of the things that uh, CEA, I'm sorry, I'm from CEA. Uh, one of the things CEA has been hearing a lot lately is that um, 
you know, we have to be primarily concerned with learning loss. And, and of course we have to be, but at the same token, the kids aren't going to be in any shape or any position to learn um, if they're struggling with these very serious mental health issues. And I think one of the number one things we can do uh, with some of this money is just ensure there's a better student to teacher ratio, um, particularly um, for students with special needs or who are EL students. Um, having some portion of the staff be specially trained as distance learning instructors. So if quarantining is an ongoing issue in the fall, um, we don't have teachers in a position of trying to teach both remotely and in person at the same time. Um, so those smaller class sizes, the dedicated distance only, um, more social workers, more school psychologists, while these people um, may be unfortunately temporary and they may be hard to find, um, more than anything, our kids need to just get through mm -hmm. the next few years. It's gonna be so difficult for them. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. And Kate, thank you for sharing. I see five more hands up and just um, as a, a heads up, we're gonna spend about 10 more minutes on this question. So Daniel, let's hear from you. Thank you. Um, my name is Daniel Pierce. I'm the state director for Educators for Excellence. We represent about a thousand um, public school teachers, primarily in Hartford, Bridgeport and New Haven. And so we surveyed our members over the past six weeks to ask them just this, how should these monies be used um, to mitigate learning loss and also to create bold, innovative programming that can be sustainable past um, just the federal dollars, which means fully funding education by the time that the federal dollars run out. So the progress made over these next few years can be sustainable. And so based on that, there were a lot of different ideas. I submitted uh, via email a more um, robust uh, document, but I want to put voice over to, to, the, to the three highlights. And so closing the digital divide doesn't just mean um, providing, you know, hotspots that are 100 megabits per second for a student. It means giving them high quality access uh, to internet, because even when we're in school and not even through remote learning, we need our students to have the technology mm -hmm. uh, to thrive in the 21st century. And so that should be the bare minimum going forward. And so part, using this money to partner with internet providers, to partner with other uh, technology organizations to make sure that our, every single student has access to high-speed internet, but also the technology to do so, so they can access the softwares that teachers are utilizing in the classroom and outside of the classroom. Uh, the second part is to the previous speakers point around social emotional learning and making sure that we have the mental health uh, professionals inside of school and outside of school to address uh, the, the incredible trauma that this past year has dealt, but also to deal with the trauma that's existed in our education system for, for far too long. Mm -hmm. um, COVID didn't, I mean, it created some issues, but it more or less highlighted the issues mm -hmm. that we already have in our education system. Um, and so, and the third part is high dosage and high frequent tutoring. So whether that's partnering with other organizations or community organizations or having paraprofessionals, uh, teacher in training, um, there's a lot of ways to, to get Train, highly trained individuals in the classroom to provide consistent and high dose tutoring uh, to those individuals to help with the learning um, loss that has happened uh, to get them back on track. And so those are just the top three. Um, and also wanted to plug um, the necessary, to, to make sure that our programs are having the intended consequences Words like engagement and disengagement are gonna be talked about throughout this process, but yet we don't define what that is. And so it's a point, it's, it's vital that we define what student engagement is and measure what that is so we can measure the programs to see what is actually working and having the intended consequences that they have. Uh, and then I know that we're gonna talk about uh, possibly like extended school days and after school and summer programming, and just wanna make sure that we're, taking to account that it's not just an extended day where students are sitting behind a desk and doing the same thing they've been doing for seven hours, but having experiential learning and uh, really strong enrichment programming to complement 
what they're learning in the classroom. So we are truly engaging our students in the education process. And so for you know further details uh, from our survey, um, I, I emailed that to you all and really appreciate this opportunity to speak and this open forum. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks for that thoughtful and descriptive um, response. Thank you. Rachel's next. Hi, um, thank you for having us and for allowing us to, to voice our, our concerns. Um, I, my children are all um, in remote learning in a very you know, unique school in Fairfield called Remote Learning Academy. Um, they are there primarily because of my own immunocompromised um, you know, position. And I think that having a high, um, high performing remote learning school like ha that has taken place here in Fairfield is something that is vital for families like mine, where either there is a medically fragile adult or medically fragile children in the household. Um, Fairfield has done a phenomenal job of um, creating, it's a separate school and um, our teachers have been with us this, the full year. Um, we've mirrored the schools that are in person in terms of um, hours required for various subjects, what is synchronous, what is asynchronous, um, there has been some disparity, but um, just as a bit of further background, I am leading the PTA for our remote learning academy and have done a survey of the members of our PTA and if they would, to understand if they would require, you know, a remote learning option for next year. Um, and I've provided that to, to um, my state representative and my board of ed and things like that. And I'm happy to share that with you all as well. But there, there is a great proportion of those people that are currently enrolled in our remote learning academy that would like to, that see the need to be able to do that um, for future. Um, it, it's not always the easiest road. It's, it's got its bumps, but... I must say, all of my children, I have a kindergartner, a first grader, a fourth grader, and a sixth grader, have all thrived in this environment. These teachers are extremely dedicated. And when my children have struggled socially and emotionally because we are fully isolated, even still, that you know, they have gone above and beyond. Um, and it's a school that I think is entirely unique to the state. So, um, you know, I, I just would like to highlight that there, there is a great remote learning experience out there to be had. And I think that there is still a need um, for that going forward. Um, and I just would like to see that being considered. Thank you, Rachel. Um, no I'm watching the time carefully because we do have to get through all five questions. So Lauren, I'm gonna take your comments on this one. And then for the others who have their hands up, please, if you wouldn't mind summarizing your responses to this in the chat, we will be capturing that as well, um, because I want to make sure that we get to put all five questions out to the group as well. So and I Rachel, would say, I would say, just um, if you are going to put your response in this chat as suggested, that you just indicate question one. So put Q one. Actually, and I will put the the text for that question in the perfect. chat, and then. Everybody can respond after that. I'll do that right now. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle, yeah. I'm sorry, Lauren, to interrupt. No worries. I will try to be quick. Um, I've had three concerns from some data I've looked at recently. One is that a lot of pre-K students who should have been enrolled were not this year. So to flag that kindergarten teachers are going to be making up for kids missing a year of education. Um, I believe that the pre-K slots were cut down by about 15% during the pandemic. Um, 
Another is the number of kids who stopped attending class almost entirely or completely entirely. Um, we know from Hurricane Katrina that student disengagement that happened during that time was largely never recaptured. Those students did not come back. And so schools are gonna need money to have people actively going to homes and helping get students back to class once classes are fully reopened. And then the last is that of student discipline. As um, Mr. Peterson said, these students have gone through extensive trauma and having mental health, extended mental health is going to be critical. But more than that, teachers knowing that they can't be sending kids out of class when they're having a trauma response is equally important. And so not just increasing the, um, the resources for students, but increasing resources for teachers and letting them know that discipline is not an acceptable response when these kids are going through so much. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for that as well. And again, I did put the text for this first question in the chat. I am gonna to move to the second question now. Um, so if you could put your answer there or um, if you've got something on the next question, then keep your hand up because <laughs> we're going there now. So I'll start here while um, Michelle's getting ready, finishing yeah. up there. So our question two is about safely reopen reopening schools and sustaining safe operations. And again, as you can see on the slide so far, um, the approach for CSDE has been, their priority has been keeping schools open, creating a site of resources with tools and guidance to help districts and families and communities as a, creating a suite of resources, I'm sorry, um, with tools and guidance to help families and communities and maintaining data on various learning models in CSDE's data portal, um, EdSite, and then establishing that in-person learning will be priority for the 2021-2022 school year. So the question number two is how might CSDE best support school districts in sustaining their safe operations and preparing for fall 2021? So Jennifer, I know you had your hand up for question one, but if you wanna start us with question two, if you have a comment, that would be great. Um, I just need to process the question for a moment. If sure. I have a thought, I'll add. Uh, the other people who spoke actually hit on all my points, so I didn't add anything in the chat for that first question. Okay. And just in case there's anyone who's having trouble with screens or you know if you're using your phone, I will read the question again. How might CSDE best support school districts in sustaining their safe operations and preparing for fall 2021? Hi, uh, this is Bob Rader from the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education. Certainly one of the concerns is our school buildings. Uh, hopefully there will be money from the federal government to ensure that our school buildings are what we expect of them. I've read all kinds of things about questions about whether venting processes in which companies sell good bread venting processes and not good venting processes, but certainly our districts need help to make sure their buildings are in good shape uh, for the students coming back. Thank you, Bob. If you meant to think about question two and any ideas about how, you, what supports you need to continue doing the things you've done, you've had to do this year to um, maintain safe operations and, and what would be helpful as you think about going into the new school year. So 
some extent, I actually would like to echo some of what Bob said. Um, and sure. it would also, though, like to amplify that um, there are uh, there are multiple districts and multiple schools that really need extra help when it comes to ensuring that the schools are school buildings are ready. And so we have to extend that to also looking at um, environmental factors that impact the environment in a given school more negatively in some settings than in others. And this is also, I think, an area where interagency collaboration is, is important and is key um, in terms of looking at Department of Public Health issues and um, environmental protection issues as well for the physical building. Thank you, Ms. Beth. Thank you, Anne, for that. Uh, Ian, just Department of Public Health and the second department. I was referencing like uh, any authorities around um, environmental protection. Sometimes that's right under public health and sometimes it might be something else. Separate, right, thank you. And I'm seeing uh, in the chat, thank you very much for putting the question number and your responses in chat as well. And continue to do that whether you've spoken and you have other ideas, if you're not comfortable speaking out or if we don't have time on a question, please use the chat as a place to, to capture your thoughts. And if there aren't more comments here, I will move on because I know that some questions are gonna gender more um, conversation than others. And then we can always come back or? Mm -hmm. That's fine. So we're gonna go on to question three, maximizing state level funds. And so the CSDE approach so far allocated $11 million of the ARP ESSER and that's the American Rescue Plan um, ESSER in the form of summer programming grants, plans to provide statewide access to resources for core subject areas, and the State Department is also considering how funding can expand comprehensive after-school programs and additional social, mental, and emotional health support. So our question number three is, what ideas do you have to address the academic impact of lost instructional time, provide summer learning and enrichment program, and provide comprehensive after-school programs? Think about what this support looks like, how it addresses vulnerable students, and if it serves students who may have been the most disengaged this year. So I know some of this did come up in question one, but again, um, we wanna hear your specific ideas about what the funds could be used to address the academic impact of lost instructional time to provide summer learning and enrichment programs and provide comprehensive after-school programs. And I see Virginia has her hand up, so we're gonna start with her. Thank you. Uh, my name is Virginia DeLong and I am the Government Relations and Advocacy Chair for the Connecticut School Counselor Association. I am also Director of Counseling and Admissions at Norwich Technical High School in Norwich. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of gonna echo what I sort of put in the chat already which is, I hear a lot about the learning loss that kids have, and, and no doubt kids did not always get the same as what they would have gotten in a traditional school year. So I don't think that any of us can argue that their learning was different. I personally don't like the term learning loss um, because that's based on, you know, uh, what adults have said kids have to know or they need to know and and that's you know not necessarily always rooted in research so um i think that in order for kids though to 
get caught up or to um, get what they need out of their education, um, we have to spend more time focusing on their social emotional needs. And I know it's already been said, and it's so refreshing to me because this is what I do all day, every day. And this is what I advocate for constantly. So it's nice to hear other groups and other people really understanding the impact um, that this has had on our kids' social emotional health. And I think as Daniel said before, this was always there. Um, this pandemic has just highlighted the fact that um, there was a need to address these things and they haven't been addressed in the past. So I think that we need to make sure that our social emotional learning um, programming is comprehensive. And that means that we not only have programs that we put in place, whether it's universal screeners, which I do believe the state has um, already purchased for, for districts to use for next year. Um, and you know, also uh, different programs that help kids to learn social and emotional skills, but it's also that other side of hiring school counselors, social workers, and psychologists. Now, I realize that's a huge price tag, um, but I also think we need to use some of this money for that and also figure out how we can sustain that after this money is gone, because I will tell you those issues with our kids are not just going to magically disappear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I can say that from the school counselor perspective, we are exhausted. We are burnt out because there are not enough of us. And if we're looking at this from an equity lens, which is the first thing I heard said this evening, um, then this is important because we have kids in this state K through 12 who do not have access to counselors, social workers, or school psychologists, um, which means that we're not you know, providing that equitable access to these services for our kids. And they are going to need these services now more than ever. Virginia, thank you. Thank you for that, those thoughts. This is Bob Rader again, just getting back to what Virginia was talking about. Maybe the risks can be involved with that, especially if the, um, if the shortage isn't the same across all areas, individual risk could be involved. Thank and you. We really want to see that too. Thank you. Daniel? Yes, uh, just to echo uh, what Virginia said real quick that, um, you know, I, I would love to see that um, SDE and, and other advocates um, really push our gov governor and legislators to fully fund education. So when these federal dollars run out, the programs that we enact can be sustained so our counselors don't go back to being overworked because there's one for a whole school district mm -hmm. or our students are falling to the wayside yet again. Um, and so just wanna put a, a exclamation point on what Virginia said there. But uh, to, this goes to a lot of what I said in the first time and um, for the first question, but really wanna highlight um, for the summer enrichment programs, really utilizing this money for those type of uh, cost prohibitive programming that our most vulnerable students typically don't have access to. So you have um, like your STEM, robotics, you know, VOAG, uh, agricultural. I mean, the list goes on um, that our students don't have access to because they're cost prohibitive. So not only uh, creating those programs, but, but providing them free to our students that need them um, to make sure that they get those experiential enrichment programs that are complement to the curriculum. Also, to catch the students who don't necessarily go to after school programs or summer programming, extending the school day, but extending it, paying teachers more for their time, but also making that additional hours more experiential uh, and engaging is key as well. Uh, to my earlier point, we don't wanna just extend the day or have tutoring programs that are just sitting behind a desk and it's the same old thing, at, you know, eight, nine hours for a child is not gonna, close the, the, the learning gaps that exist. And so really making sure we're thinking creative there. And then last point, because it was in the question itself, you can see you use the word disengaged. Mm -hmm. And so often engagement and disengagement are linked to attendance. But as teachers know all too well, a student can be in attendance, but not engaged mm -hmm. as a counselor knows as well, right? And so we need to make sure that we're prioritizing what that means 
and defining it and finding measures to assess it. So then we can actually see what is working, what is engaging our students in and outside of the classroom. And so we can double down on those efforts rather than throwing good money after bad. And so um, again, just really appreciate the time um, and, and thank you. Thanks again, Daniel. Anne? Thank you. And I, I want to um, thank Daniel and uh, Virginia in particular for the comments that they made. Uh, I also just want to share that um, though it isn't showing up in these uh, five questions, the next slide um, under that in the introduction talked about looking for innovative ways to support our, our students and families. And I would be encouraging us to use this opportunity and this once in a lifetime stream of funding to implement some of the innovative ways that families and communities can support educators in making sure that our students have the best opportunities to live their lives uh, with dignity and to be able to choose those life outcomes that, that are of interest to them and not imposed by others. So mm -hmm. along those lines, I think that those comments that Daniel is making about making sure that we are capturing um, those students that may not fall into the categories um, that we're careful about how we are looking at engagement and disengagement also require us to extend beyond those organizations, providers, and resources that we always go to and make sure that we are reaching out to those neighborhood community-based organizations, the ones that serve our students and provide services that others do not. And um, this is an opportunity that we should not miss to make sure that we are engaging those neighborhood providers that have the reach and the connections, both cultural and societal, that can engage those students. Thank you, Anne. Thank you very much for their comments as well. Jennifer. So um, I'm an art teacher and representing the Kinnika Art Association. Um, and in, you know, the focus is always on the core subjects, but um, the arts can help uh, build students' confidence and their emotional, um, uh, their emotional, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, uh, their SEL, we'll just use that term. Um, so in, I, I think there's an opportunity here to find ways to integrate mm. um, the arts, you know, into some of these, you know, if you wanna continue additional after school, programs. I have students at my school who are currently doing some of the after school programs. They try to get out of it. They, they're, they, they're not enjoying it. They don't, they're not, it's just more school to them. Um, we need to find ways to re-engage them. You know, throughout this school year, my students have, you know, come back slowly. We've, we've been hybrid and then now we're full in. Um, this, my students who've come back most recently, who've had that adult with them, you know, all day long, guiding their instruction, I'm talking elementary here, um, it's difficult for them to develop their own ideas independently. So the arts is a way that might be able to help them build that confidence, you know, uh, cr you know writing, you know, your writing skills, drawing pictures before you write is, is a non-threatening way to, to build ideas and build story. So I encourage you to, to find a way to integrate the arts into getting our students more engaged um, because they will not see it as that other learning. And if you, if you do it the right way. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for that good idea. You see, you're getting lots of support in the comments too. And thanks again for using the chat because that's gonna help us again to um, reinforce what's important to, to you all in this room. Are there any other comments on question three? We're doing really well on time. So, Virginia, you're back, yes? 
Um, I just wanted to add kind of along the lines of what Jennifer was just saying too, is really thinking outside of the box about how we can re-engage families, not just the students. Um, but I think there have been a lot of parents who um, have been disengaged this year, not by their choice, but because of working, maybe working more hours, maybe taking fair care of family members. And you know, it's just really changed family dynamic dynamics this year. So I think we've not only found that we have um, disengaged students, but disengaged families. So I think we need to look at the whole picture when we're looking at that and how do we reconnect families with their own children and then reconnect them to school. Um, because I think particularly in some of our areas where our students haven't shown up this year in a lot of our urban districts, that's gonna be incredibly important. Thank you, Virginia. Anyone else on question three? And thanks again for using the chat. Bob, hi, Bob. Sorry, I, I just- Nope, no problem, thank you. The, the part about core subject areas, can you just tell us what SDE is doing in that area in particular? In this question? Yes. Yes, it's my statewide access. Sorry. It's in bullet. It's in bullet two. Access yeah. resources for core subject areas. Um, so, is our state de department person on the line? I am aware that there is a learning hub, Bob, on the website. Oh, the learning hub. Okay. Yes, yeah, that is broken out by domain. Um, but certainly, if the state department person wants to expand on that. Nope, that's exactly right. Thank you um, for mentioning the hub. Um, that is the the main way, and we are in the process of pulling together additional resources to put into the hub um, in the coming weeks. Thanks, Laura. Yep. Thanks, Bob. All right, I'm gonna go on to question four. Supporting LEAs in planning for and meeting students' needs. The approach so far for CSDE provided guidance or a roadmap to districts with setting state level priorities and publishing guidance documents, supported districts by providing ample technical support from a variety of sources, engaged in a webinar and multiple communications with districts on their development of the local school district plans. So the question for number four is, how might you want CSD to support districts in developing high quality plans for their use of ARP ESSER funds. How might you want CSD to support districts in developing high quality plans for their use of ARP ESSER funds? So these are the funds that the districts have separate from CSDE. What kinds of supports would you want from CSDE on the use of district ARP ESSER funds? Bob. Well, we, we always push for flexibility in, in how you look at these plans, but it would also help to have sort of a warehouse of ideas that can be, uh, you know, best, best practices right across the state. So any district can look at them uh, easily and perhaps implement them in, their, in that particular district. Thank you. I'm gonna give you guys a couple minutes to think about think about this. So Bob, can I come back with a follow-up on that one? Um, sure. Do you want those the warehouse of best practices? So can anything go up or do you want it to be curated in some way? Um, do you want it, you know, uh, indexed by, um, you know, large district, small district? Do you want it, um, you know, cataloged well, that, by, you well, know? That, would, that would definitely help, Michelle, you know, to make it easy as possible to use it and yet also know what the results have been with these practices. 
might be great for a big district, for, for a little tiny district might not work. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification, sure. Michelle and Bob. Jennifer? So one of the things that just came to mind as, as I'm reading um, this is oftentimes um, when there's webinars, there's a disconnect in what you do as a teacher and, and how you end up implementing it. Sometimes needing to see someone else implementing something that's successful uh, could be helpful. So maybe there could be a way for like a, ne a network through the, the rest to like have teachers see something that's successful and have conversation about it and reflect upon what they see so that it's not just a webinar, here's my theory, here's what I do. And then you go back to your classroom and maybe not implement it mm -hmm. or as, as quickly as you could if you actually see it. Like I'm a visual learner, I need to see it. So maybe finding a way to, to do that, to, to get uh, partnerships between districts, between the RESCs to give, um, so that we're not all reinventing the wheels, you know, in our own district, you know, to, to, to observe and see uh, from each other. Thanks, Jennifer. Virginia. Um, it's like Jennifer read my mind um, a little bit anyway. Um, I, I was thinking about roundtable meetings that could be held for districts, um, kind of like this. I, I appreciate the opportunity to have these smaller groups where you can actually contribute because, <laughs> you know, sometimes you're in a group of 200 people in a webinar and you don't really have a chance to speak or maybe you don't want to because there's so many people. Um, but I think that that's, you know, I think that having the hub or whatever you know Bob was kind of describing I think that's a great idea but then having throughout the year too because I think there was a lot of focus on reopening last year um, and it felt very rushed I was on a reopening committee for my former district and it felt like we had to have this plan come out right away and we understood that you know time was what time was at that point but then it was that and then it's like I think our district felt like we were on our own at that point to figure things out so I think having round tables maybe over the summer this you know to really get districts to share ideas about what they're going to be doing and then checking in throughout the year like what do you need how is it going like how can we support you maybe future round tables to say this is what we tried and it's not working does do other people have other ideas and how we can switch this up thank you virginia i don't see any other Hands up. I'm going to give a few more seconds for ideas to ruminate. We've got some time on this one. And again, just want to thank you all for your contributions and for your um, just being really explicit with your ideas and descriptive and giving us some, you know, what it would look like. Yes. Um, in terms of the providing guidance, um, I certainly want to echo that because many times it appears that what is given is guidance, but we really want to see from the perspective of, of the advocates, the families. Um, we would like to see the State Department of Education provide greater direction because oftentimes we have even within districts, uh, great variability around how the guidance is interpreted and implemented. The other piece would be anything that CSDE could do to ensure and support authentic family engagement. Mm -hmm. At the highest levels, at the very beginning of discussions around developing any plans, the districts might be required to do, they should be required to make sure that they have authentic parent, family, and community engagement. If Connecticut is committed to dual capacity building, certainly we are at a time when that can be of great benefit to make sure that you are capturing the broadest representation of perspectives from a broad 
array of populations that will be impacted by the policies that are being made. So rather than make the policy decisions and then circulate them to parents, families, and communities and youth and say, here's, here's what we have, what do you think? Have them at the table when you are making those policy decisions. Get their input and their insights because we want to avoid what oftentimes is referred to as unintended consequences mm -hmm. because those unintended consequences are the result of systems that don't take into account the perspectives of the individuals that will be receiving their services. And thank you. Thank you again for those. Everyone's comments seem so well. And you, you all came with cards already to talk to us because everyone seems so, comments are so well thought out. So I'm glad that you were thinking about this. And um, obviously I know we know it's really important to you. That's why we're here and that's why you're here. So I'm gonna open up question five now. I can start on this side and like give Michelle a chance to finish up her notes on four. Um, so number five is about supporting the educator workforce. So the approach for CSD so far is recognizing the need for a qualified and well-trained educator workforce, right? Not a new approach, but that's been a continued one. Um, made allowances for daily long-term substitutes and expansion of pathways for paraeducators in partnership with Regional Education Service Center Alliance, the REST Alliance, developed the mentoring team program and invested in partnerships to inspire young generations from diverse populations to join the workforce. So the question on number five is, how might CSDE best support the educated workforce, both in supporting current educators to address students' academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs and in recruiting a diverse pool of new educators to fill vacancies caused by the pandemic. So a lot of these things we've touched on in terms of the student impact. And so this question is how might CSD best support the educator workforce, um, both in current educators, uh, supporting them to address students' academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs, and in recruiting a diverse pool of new educators to fill vacancies caused by the pandemic. Daniel, I see your hand up. Uh, yes. Um, so a few a few options that uh, a lot of our teachers have discussed over the past several months um, during this, you know, crazy trauma filled year uh, is also having mental health support for teachers. Um, so not only for the students, so making sure that the teachers have uh, the necessary time um, and, and resources, whether it's mental health professionals uh, directly or is more planning time, more prep time uh, to give them breaks throughout the, the course of the day, especially for those school districts that are in block scheduling. Um, and also having trainings for them for how they can deal with uh, students to a comment made earlier around, you know, uh, exclusionary discipline and how we should, you know, be banning that mm. as, as a state, but, but for, you know, for teachers that have the resources for restorative practices and those type of trainings, uh, in addition to PD around how to teach uh, in the 21st century modeling, right? So uh, using the softwares and the technologies uh, that they need. And as we have an aging teacher population here in Connecticut, that is vital to make sure that they're uh, utilizing what the students are, are utilizing and they're able to speak the same language uh, there. Um, and um, also for, for um, you know, MTR, minority teacher recruitment and making sure that we have those is making sure that we're, we're really uh, trying to, to cut any red tape that is, is prohibitive. Um, and making sure that we have easier pathways for paraprofessionals, for teacher and trainings, uh, and, and demonstrating to our youth, because this is a long-term plan as well, right? So demonstrating to our youth in our communities that teaching is a viable option for them um, 
you know, as, you know, a career path into the middle class and, and to make sure that it's a sustainable approach as well. So you grow your own programs in the high schools and starting it as early as middle school, talking about teaching as a profession as well, uh, to make sure that this isn't a, a short term fix, but a long term solution. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you again for, for your thoughts. So I'm going to just time in. I know I'm not supposed to Daniel, but that just lit my fire. So we used to have future teachers um, of America in our high schools, and I would love to see that brought back. It's not to, to continue, but it's those type of programs and the arts and the music. It's those type of programs that get cut first but they're so essential and we need to start treating them as essential programming and, and, and you know, treating them like the math and sciences and English and, and really look at our students holistically and our teachers holistically. So um, uh, it really is, is refreshing to be in a group of uh, individuals like everyone here who are passionate about this. So thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I was just going to share that many times when I attend professional development as uh, a teacher, um, uh, if there's a professional development for the para educators, it's it's sort of done separately. They're they're different trainings, and since we all work together, it would really be I think important to have some of these trainings where it's the whole school community, not just like oh this is a teacher in service day and this is what's available for para educators to to have that happen uh, in a collaborative environment. Um, I think would really be helpful. Thank you. Thanks for that, Jennifer. You know, that just reminded me of, you know, I think of of my current work day. I wake up at five in the morning to check in my student work um, before my work day, do my work day, and I'm usually on till seven uh, checking in work. And then this year, in addition, um, like for pet professional development for teachers, a lot of that burden has been on us as teachers in our districts. And, you know, they they turn to us to be the experts and it would be great if um, you know the state could take the lead on, on not having you know districts provide their own professional development because there is no money for it. Like this current year, our PD money was zero. You know we couldn't attend of things out of district. Um, there needs to be. It, it can't always be the teachers in your school leading the, because it, it falls onto the same teachers all the time. I, I tend to be one of them, uh, you know? So I, I think we need to find ways to uh, collaborate across the state so that um, it doesn't fall on uh, people in that way so that there's not more of a burden. All of this training that we're talking about um, is gonna turn back to the people in our schools and then those teachers will have a larger burden again. Thank you, Jennifer. Virginia. Um, so to kind of echo and bring together what everyone has been saying, um, we need to be hiring the staff that are trained to do the jobs that they're trained to do. Um, because I, I, again, have to bring it back to when you don't have enough support staff in the building, then our teachers then take on that role of dealing with social, emotional, mental health issues in their classroom. And not that teachers shouldn't have to deal with that to a certain extent, um, but when it becomes unmanageable to maintain the classroom environment, that's where we step in. But when you don't have those people for the teachers to send the students to, that's a problem. Or when you don't have the special special education staff um, to meet, truly meet the needs of our special education students, which I can tell you many districts do not. Um, and they're, they're just hanging by a thread and doing the best they can with the special education population. Um, then that creates more stress for everyone all around. So really supporting um, teachers is supporting the structure of the school building, um, you know, from, the, the um, resources that they need, 
to the people um, and the training that is necessary to run a school building. Thanks, Virginia. Thank you. Jamie. Hi, uh, I just wanted to circle back to something Daniel had said earlier about engagement and just thinking about parent engagement. And, you know, this is my 20th year as a teacher. I don't know that I know exactly what parent engagement looks like. You know, like what is, what are we hoping for in defining that? Um, as a parent, I go to some school sponsored events when, when that was uh, available, but not everyone can do that. But does that mean that parent is disengaged? So I'd like there to be a little bit of a conversation about defining what is parent engagement synonymous with parent support for the teacher in the education system? Or are we looking for them to physically be in the building and just kind of define the parameters of that a little bit more? Because sometimes I'm, I feel like I'm, as a professional uh, trying to achieve something that hasn't been defined for me. So it's just, I know that was like question three or two, or <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay, I appreciate that comment. And I think that, um, you know, I'd, I'd like, we have a little bit of, of time here because we're doing a little on time, I think, because we have a nice small group as someone said earlier. And if there are um, folks on the call who are also parents or have been, had parents, had children, in school at some point, if you wanna share what your vision of engaged parenting in school looks like, that would be great. I wanna offer before someone jumps in there too, Michelle. So Jamie, there is a resource that was um, generated by the State Department of Education as an offspring of the dual capacity framework, that it is exactly as you, um, you know, titled is creating, you know, um, equitable and engaging, you know, family community partnerships or opportunities. And it takes it beyond um, what you're describing in regards to, it doesn't always look like showing up for kindergarten registration or the teacher parent conference or the event, right? So there's a variety of other ways that um, that can look. So um, that is a resource that I know is available to you as well. Thanks, Michelle, for sharing that. I see Rachel's hands up and feel free to add your, your vision of engaged parenting in schools too. Sure. I. I guess as a parent and not an educator, um, sometimes I I don't know what is expected of me. I, um, as I said earlier, I have children from kindergarten to sixth grade, and what I have chosen to do as engagement is to be involved in my PTA, to actively listen to board of education, to reach out to my teachers and offer you know, whatever assistance I can um, as a stay-at-home mom, I, I have the ability to go into the classroom. Um, but I don't feel like it's terribly clear what, um, you know, parent engagement looks like. Um, so I just kind of paved my own path. Um, so maybe I'm just not looking at the right resources, but, um, you know, if there was a way for teachers to tell me what they need, um, or if there was a clear, you know, set of guidance, hey, here's what an engaged parent looks like. I think most parents I speak to, they just don't know how to be engaged. Um, mm. But that's, that's just my two cents. Rachel, thank you. Thank you for sharing your um, your perspective on that. Bob? Yeah, uh, one of the things that was started a few years ago that sort of has apparently run out of steam is the idea of the school governance councils. Mm -hmm. And it would seem to me that if they were reinvigorated, perhaps with, with different rules or at least looking at what has worked and what has not worked, that would be another way to uh, increase parent, parental en engagement. And it always seemed to me that the school governance councils could really serve also as another way to know what's going on in the community, to help people understand the problems the schools are having uh, and build support for the schools, including the teachers, the administrators and everyone else. 
Great, Bob, thank you. Jennifer. Um, I wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, this past year, um, I was uh, a one member in my school of a family outreach committee where we reached out to the families to, to, to try to meet their needs. And one of the things that I learned is teachers assume the parents know and the parents assume that they don't, that parents don't want to feel like they, they don't want to let on that they don't know something. So mm. they, they don't, you know, uh, ask questions or, or they had a horrible experience in school and they're relying on that as their basis. So I spent a lot of time, especially in September, October and November with our families, just reaching out and saying, I'm here to help anything. And I spent a lot of time, you know, one, one parent, um, she's like, this is too hard for my son. And I said, well, explain. And I said, well, he's in kindergarten he's not going to be able to, you know, include 10 details automatically, but that's the standard, you know, and three to five, and then we build five to six. And then she's like, oh, and I said, why don't we do it together? We did it live. I showed her and I said, and she's like, yeah, that's what I've been doing. And I said, keep on going, you know, and, and that family is so engaged, you know, since that experience, because they felt like my son can't do this. And then just that conversation helped them understand that developmental, you know, what we take for granted as teachers, we understand the developmental levels of our students and where they're going to grow and how they grow. Parents don't all know that. So we have to be a team, the administrators, our families, our students, the teachers, to be a team to, to help educate everyone. So we're all, we all have all the information so that we can be a team to grow our students to be really successful. And I have to say, it, I spent extra hours doing that this year, but it's been one of the most um, humbling and gratifying experiences that I've had because parents, once you start that conversation, you have them, you know? And if we can start that in kindergarten and build that through the years, um, we can really make change with getting those families involved. Thanks, Jennifer. And thanks for that vivid and real example. Thank you. Tammy. Hi, thank you. Um, I think when I think about parent engagement and I've been engaged as a parent for over a decade in my district, um, we have parent advisory councils. So every school in our district has a council and then it reports into a system-wide council where parents have access to the superintendent every single month. And um, we really, the parents drive the agendas, although it's facilitated and, and managed by central office people, but really parents can bring things up and put them on the agenda. And empowering parents to make change has really made our advisory councils very effective. We have hosted uh, underage drinking sessions, social hosting sessions, put more cameras on buses. Like we've done things that are very near and dear to parents' hearts, but also mm -hmm. help the district. Um, from a dual capacity standpoint, we also have a special needs um, parent advisory council where parents raise what the issues or concerns they have. And we bring in speakers that can address those issues in a dual capacity form. Um, we've had transition services um, speakers, we've had um, state agencies come as speakers, we've had structured literacy. Um, so I think if you peel it back a little bit more, I agree with the person who just spoke before me about getting parents engaged early and at that kindergarten level. But I think um, you also have to look at your demographics and you have to understand why aren't parents engaged. So what are their needs and what may be preventing them? And I think going through COVID, there's an opportunity now to do things like with CPAC um, and their programs such as Next Steps. That's a program they used to run. It's for eight weeks parent training. They used to run that two, maybe three times a year in different parts of the state. Well, that's now gone online. 
So mm -hmm. for parents who might not be able to drive a half an hour or an hour to go sit in a class for two hours, it may make accessibility to those types of programs um, different. I'm sure there'll still be in-person programs and I'll, I'm sure they'll still rotate across the state. Um, but I, I think that's one of the ways. Um, uh, going back to the why, I think you also have to look in your, um, your cultures in your area. For many cultures, it's not appropriate for parents to question teachers, to speak up at parent-teacher conferences. Mm -hmm. So the ability to give parents the permission mm -hmm. to actually speak with the teachers and say, you know, we want to have a conversation with you. We want you to question us and let us know if you don't understand something instead of um, a parent maybe thinking that maybe I'm disrespectful if I'm asking questions about what my child is doing, or they may think that I, I don't think they're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that permission to um, ask for more information really at the same time that we try to get parents involved at that early age of kindergarten and early elementary, we have to be explicit about that and really tell parents, it's okay, we want to hear from you, please speak up and um, make those phone calls, invite them and follow up with them. Um, because when you do get a network of parents who do support the district, it makes a huge difference to all the families, all the students, all the teachers. Thank you. Tammy, thank you for that. And thank you for, again, for your great examples, um, um, vivid and real examples. Anne? All excellent points, Tammy. And I also want to point out that in the chat, um, I put a link to Connecticut's Statewide Family Engagement Center project. This is a federally funded project and we're calling ours in Connecticut, Connecticut Family Schools Partnership. Um, it is a collaboration. Um, our project lead is CREC, and the partners are AFCAMP, um, excuse me, AFCAMP, CERC, CPAC, and also the State Department of Ed. And so reaching out to districts to help them as they strive to implement authentic family engagement along the dual capacity framework that's been adopted in Connecticut uh, is, is where you can go for some additional resources. And then also um, helping to empower your parents and families and you so that they can feel comfortable and they can feel competent and empowered and welcome to collaborate with school districts, with LEAs. So that resource is in there. And thank you very much for the resource. And again, for all of your contributions to our, our conversation. So that was our fifth and last question and we're at 707. Um, I know that you all do not wanna leave us before 730. So, <laughs> but having said that, um, you know, if there are comments if you want to go back to question one, two, three, if there was something that you wanted to clarify or, um, you know, confirm or underscore, please take this opportunity to do that. And then we'll just have a few um, closing comments. Virginia. Um, I think one of the things that will be important to, we've talked a lot about sustainability because we all know this money is not going to last forever. Mm -hmm. And so really finding ways in, in all capacities that we can, um, because if we're trying, our goal is to create our best schools right now, right, in Connecticut, we want that to be able to continue um, through the future. So working you know, with the legislature and everything on how we're going to fund this going forward. Um, but I'm even thinking like things like, I know in some of the districts I've heard from, the fact that our kids have been able to, and families have been able to access food, you know, beyond just the school day, you know, that they can pick up breakfasts and breakfasts and lunches and, and sometimes dinners and whatever um, from their school districts uh, through the summer, but even through the school year has made a huge impact on some kids um, and their learning. So being able to sustain programs like that, even if the federal programs, you know, go away. <laughs> um, 
you know, having universal pre-K for our kids, um, you know, having the support stuff that we need, having these after school and these summer programs, you know, finding ways to continue these programs for our most vulnerable students. But I think the overall piece of it is this cannot be a Band-Aid that we slap on the problem that we're having right now. We have to find ways and work together to create long-term solutions um, for education or we're just gonna go right back to where we were. Thank you, Virginia. Jamie? Um, I just wanted to go back to when I first spoke about having a hey, son. I'm with gonna me. ask you to wait one moment so I can catch up. I'm so sorry. That's the oh, first no, that's time fine. I had to do that. <laughs> Um, back to Jennifer's, uh, no, it wasn't Jennifer, the last speaker. Virginia. Um, I missed your last part about having enriching opportunities, mental health programs, and um, the summer programming and after school programming, being able to sustain those for our most vulnerable students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Virginia. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay. Um, I just wanted to circle back at the beginning when I shared that my younger son has autism and just talking about um, loss of skills and I, I don't know, we talked about that, but I mean, for some kids, the loss was really significant. Like my son forgot to tie his shoes. He didn't know how to do that anymore because he didn't have OT at school and he didn't have OT in the community. All of that was shut down. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when we we talk about uh, digital divide, um, I worry about this idea of snow days becoming remote days because that just means a lost day of instruction for my son. And it's not like anyone saying to me, oh, during the extended school year, we're gonna tack on that day because we know your kid doesn't have accessibility to uh, receiving an education this way. So that really concerns me. Um, I've been pretty floored as an individual that that, uh, might even be on the radar as as a, a way of moving forward. So um, I just want to reiterate that the enrichment opportunities for kids with special needs, um, they already struggle with uh, social emotional learning, many with across disabilities. So, you know, when we talk about extended school year, it's great to, to hone in those academic skills, but the enrichment really needs to be for uh, this very much this long period of isolation right that that occurred and just such a such a gap sliding backwards of those skills those social skills so i just wanted to clarify that right. earlier jamie thank you i think that was really helpful um you know again that it, the, the more um vivid that's the word that keeps coming to my mind that your examples can be the more it's going to help us to understand and when we go back and and look at the notes um to kind of understand what it is that, that, that you want and that what's gonna be helpful. Thank you. Daniel. I'm sorry for uh, keep speaking up, but since we have the time- That's why uh, we're just, here, thank you. Just wanna <laughs> underscore what Virginia said around school funding. Um, we know that these funds have an end date that they have to be allocated by September of 2023. And we know that the current phase in of our ECS state funding model is 2028. And so I would love to see the, the power of the department be able to advocate and leverage their relationships in at the Capitol to advocate that we expedite that phase in to coordinate with the drop off of these federal dollars. If not, we're going to have three year gap between fully funding our education system and when these federal dollars run out, which means layoffs, which means we're falling back into a cycle that we knew wasn't working uh, before. So I, I, I would urge uh, and, and, and applaud the department if they could use their voice and their power to, to help um, all of our parent and education advocacy organizations that are, are working towards that effort. Um, and also to, to Jamie's point, we need to fully fund our special education. We have yet to do that on a federal and state level, um, which mm -hmm. you know goes to the reasoning why we have to cut corners around our special education programming. And, it, and a lot of it does come from the funding side. And so uh, being focal advocates there, I understand that you know budgets are tight uh but we need to put our our youth and our education um at the forefront so thank you great thanks daniel jennifer 
Just another quick uh, comment, and and this thought keeps popping back into my head the last few months. Um, for those students who've been who are still currently distance learning and and who may plan to go back in person in the fall, we really need to look at the transitions between elementary school to middle school. I think of my fifth graders who the last time they were in school with their peers, they were maybe 10, just turned 10, mm -hmm. um, you know, in an elementary school setting prior to all that, all that um, social stuff that happens between fifth and sixth grade. Next year, they're arriving in a school where they know no teachers and they're with peers who have grown socially in a way that could be really detrimental to some uh, of their uh, emotional growth. Um, I'm really concerned about some of my fifth graders who are going into middle school seventh, well, they're currently sixth graders, but I've not seen them in person. I'm worried about them. There needs to be something to bridge that gap. And I'm sure it's again between middle school and high school for those seventh and eighth graders who've been in middle school for these two years, who now are gonna be thrown into the high school. Expectations are different at, at each grade level. And mm -hmm. I'm fortunate that I work in an apartment where we talk vertically K to 12. You know, so we know what's going on, but that doesn't happen everywhere. It doesn't happen in every department. It doesn't happen in every district. I'm worried about those students who really, really worried um, about their emotional, um, the trauma that they're gonna go through um, when they're in person next year. And, and a lot of them are quiet children who will keep it internally and their mental health is going to be um, a big issue. And I hope that I don't hear about anything about any of them because you know that, that happens, I don't know. Jennifer, thank you for sharing that. I can hear the concern in your voice. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Anne? Yes, Jennifer, thank you. Um, I would also just want to share that we are, we are looking to educators to do not only what educators were trained to do, but to the extent that we are looking at educators to do things that they are not trained to do, not qualified to do, that is a concern. Mm -hmm. And for those students, especially, um, if you look at the ones that like Jennifer is concerned about, she's talking about the, the quiet ones, you're talking about the ones that you know, may not necessarily come to your attention. Uh, we do need to make sure that we have trained individuals available for those students. And so rather than suspending and expelling those students, having the mental health professionals available to provide mm -hmm. them with the supports, the special education staffing that's, that's necessary to adequately support those students is really key. And just continuing to be cognizant of the fact that when we fail to address those students' needs, um, they're not necessarily going to be able to say, you know, I'm having a pretty bad day today. And I think that it would really benefit me if I could have some um, time out of the classroom and get a little bit of support. They're not going to be able to articulate that. Right. And coming out of 18 months by that time of a pandemic, we are definitely going to be seeing more of our students who are gonna be in need. And so I want us to be thinking about ways to bring those supports into the schools where it is the individuals that are trained and have the, the skills to assist those students. That's not necessarily what you're gonna be able to um, upskill educators to do or what we should be upskilling educators to do. That's not what they became educators to provide. But let's be innovative about looking at how we can do that. And school-based mental health centers, school-based health centers, all of those resources that provide the foundation to address the, the social determinants of health, 
those basic needs that students have to have met in order to be able to excel academically, we need to be taking this opportunity to leverage every opportunity we have. I used opportunity twice, sorry, but to leverage what we have so that it's not just a one shot deal. Let's make sure that we're building an infrastructure that can maintain our kids going forward and support our, our educators, our families, our administrators. And it's not just SDE that has to do that. And it's not just the SEA, um, the SEA or the LEAs because that takes interagency collaboration that we are always trying to get in place, looking at the Children's Behavioral Health Plan, advisory board and some other things there's 12 state agencies that have been appointed to that by the legislature in their wisdom. We believe that there are some that are missing because it needs all of that working well together to support our families. And thank you. And I see Lauren's hand is up. I'm gonna give Michelle another minute. <laughs> oh, not a minute, a few seconds <laughs> to catch up. And then um, I'm gonna ask Lauren for her comments as well. We are getting close to the end of our time. So just be, um, no. Okay, Lauren. So I had put a comment in the chat a little earlier about um, connecting with housing insecure parents. And Anne's, Anne's comment just raised for me that this is a space where with all of this federal money coming in in the next two years, um, our kids are gonna have needs, but our parents are gonna have needs too that impacts how the kids show up in the classroom. And so one area where not just SDE, but 211 could help, the, the um, youth service bureaus could help, but schools really um, could use a listing of what services and, and community programs are available for their parents who are struggling with housing insecurity, with um, food insecurity, and meeting their kids' basic needs. Parents who can't find childcare in the area because 20% of our centers have closed down over the pandemic. Um, there's gonna be a lot that, that the parents are bringing and that's gonna impact kids' ability to show up in the classroom even kids' ability to come to after-school programs because maybe they have to go home and watch little brother or little sister because parents don't have infant and toddler care. Mm -hmm. um, I just, we talked a lot about parent engagement during this time. And I just realized that we really miss talking about parental needs in this conversation. And while it's not school's responsibility to write a rent check for parents, um, it, it, we do need to be cognizant that that is going to impact kids over the next two years. Um, and schools need to be prepared for how to help support kids and parents in their communities. Um, even if that's just knowing the right phone number to call. Lauren, thank you. Thank you for bringing that perspective in as well. We have time for maybe one more comment. And if not, then we will, we will do our comment. <laughs> okay, Bob. Okay. Uh, I just wanna say um, thanks to all the teachers, the guidance people, the arts, people, you guys do a tremendous job. And this year has been so terrible and so difficult to so many. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to know that you're out there and thank you and keep up the good work. And, you know, as the executive director of the Connecticut Association of Boards of Education, if there are ways to reach out and work together, um, just, just give me a call. I'm on the phone book or you can uh, uh, email me. But I think what, what the staff of our districts, administrators, teachers, uh, support staff, paras, what a year. And thank you for all that you're, you're doing. 
Bob, thank you. And as we're closing out, I want to echo your thanks. I am, you know, my heart is warmed by hearing from this this small group in here um, about all of the the innovative ways that you're already thinking about what our state can do and, and sharing the things that you're already doing in your schools and in your districts and in your homes as well. So again, um, just, just thank you for being the parents that you are and educators that you are. So I think, Michelle, anything before we close out? No, I'm just putting into the chat the uh, email link if you have any other comments or- oh, good. you took that away from me. <laughs> Ideas that have come up, um, obviously, between now and Monday. Um, we so thank you for your time tonight. Um, as the commissioner said in her opening, there's many things you all could be doing, but that you made this the priority, um, again, warmed my heart. Um, you, I think, encapsulated a lot of the things that um, we as a CERC agency would want to see um, in regards to our mission for equity and excellence in education. So thank you to each of you for, for being part of this tonight. That is the end of the night. Um, I don't think we're, we're not going back to the main room, so. I'm going to stop the recording now.